All right. Good afternoon, all of you. I see a lot of people in the room. That's always nice. First of all, the video camera. I saw that you normally were not doing a lot, so I will be moving up and down. So uh, make sure to be able to follow me. Um, I gave uh, a talk on the on the discover on the on the conference. I think one or two years ago as well. And then they re-asked me, so it must have not been that bad, let's say. Um, I want to introduce you to probably an area that you're not very familiar with, but an area that's very close to my heart. Um, and you will feel that when I'm, I'm talking about it. So I'm glad that you're joining me in a, in a combined world of, of dairy and data. So first of all, I'll introduce a little bit of myself. I was born on a, on a farm of my grandparents. This is me when I was very young. So in 86, something like that. So uh, I was introduced, let's say, also to this kind of animal in the back. My grandmother was milking them by hand. Um, but I was always a bit more of a techie. So I was, um, let's say, I was more into computers at that moment. The first, Pent uh, not even not Pentiums, uh, 386, 286. Those computers were there when I was uh, born. So that's a little bit of uh, my, my, fir uh, my current background. To give you an idea, so I was born in 82, 92, I got my first PC, destroyed it the same year, <laughs> did a, a veterinary degree in 2006, I on top did a PhD in vet med, I did a, an extra master's in data science, and uh, one of the things that happened is that I cer certainly have said somewhere in my, st my uh, training as a vet, I said, statisticians, what the heck are these guys doing? because I had no idea about what's, what the real world was about at that moment. And I, said, I, I, I definitely have said this to people. So to give you an idea how you can describe me now, this is me. I still palpate animals, so I still am a, pr a practical uh, clinician. So I, I work with cows almost on a daily basis. Um, so I did a PhD in a veterinary degree, very boring stuff. Th it became very interesting when I did an extra master's in data science. So you can see me now, and at this moment, I'm an assistant professor in at the Farm Animal Health of Utrecht University. You'll quickly understand who I am. This is my house. Every time that my wife, I put on the slide, somebody, but uh, in fact, it's my wife. If she says that I have to do something twice, I check for tools to help me out. So our house is full of raspberry pies <laughs> and Arduinos. She hates it, but I love it, because we can automate a lot of stuff. And by doing that, I got to really learn what's possible in, in the world of, of cows. My vision, partly academic driven, is that the fairness of, let's say, the entire data community will become more and more important as we are moving into a world where, let's say, value of data needs to be mined. Yeah, right now, especially in my business, there's almost no um, value created on top of data just because we're not willing to share data. First of all, and this is where I need you guys. I want to poll you. So get out your phones. I want to ask you some very, very basic questions. Yeah, two questions. Yeah, please fill in the survey. Um, I guess normally you should be able to do it. It's very dairy-driven questions, and I want to see how you react on it. Do we see the results showing up in a minute? Ah, the, the administrator is doing that. You get the questions? That's nice nowadays. Was it possible to answer them? Yeah, I see nodding. It's not that difficult. It's just questions that I ask. And can we now show them on the... Yeah, I see people answering. That's good. I have already 62 people answering. So I think you probably need to close somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Can we go back one slide? Perfect. <laughs> 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 
only 32% of you answered right. Go to the grocery store tonight and buy a bottle of milk and buy a bottle of water and you'll see. Milk is the cheapest of the three. Factfulness. Read the book. We are tricked by people around us about data. Make sure that you know the right facts. Yeah? So I'll show you the second question, if you can. Can you go to the next question as well? 55% of you are wrong, again. Yeah. You know who is the strongest contributor to climate change? All of us. Transport. Flying. Us having multiple children. It's not agriculture. Agriculture is at number three. Yeah. And some people will debate number two. Yeah. We have an issue, but don't think it's the first one. We will be working on this, and I'll show you some things um, while moving into. The truth about milk, and this is why I want to show you. It's very close to my heart. The truth about milk, to give you an idea, this is an article from the 3040s, 3040. Some guy, yeah, at that moment, who thought he was smart, he uh, showed people that if you show fat calories intake from, from dairy products at that time against the number of deaths in a specific country, he thought that he saw a linear, yeah, let's say, um, association that the more milk you drink, the more dead people you have in the country. Yeah. He forgot to show these data points. But the damage was done. People think it's a bad product. Let's give me some hint. Yeah. Why do we drink milk? Very simple, because we were evolved as mammals. You drank from your mother. It took us about yeah, 200 million years to grow to do that. That's not for nothing. This is Nora. Nora was born two weeks ago, three weeks ago. She's my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> to give you an idea, I'll show you some data about her. She was born at 3.4 kilograms. She dropped immediately to 3.2, and then she started increasing again in body weight. To give you some idea, now she looks already like that. Yeah, Let's focus a bit on these days. Nora grew about 3.6 to 4.2 in two weeks. Yeah, that means she grew about 43 kilograms uh, per day. The only thing she eats, and I can assure you, yeah, is milk. Milk contains about 10% solids. So if you evaporate all the water, you have about 10 grams in there. If she drinks about 0.6 liters, and she does, believe me, that would mean a conversion of about 70%. So 70% of what she eats, dry matter-based, she puts into weight. Feed conversion, they call it. And this is a bit scary, because I will start comparing my daughter to other animals. If you look at, if you feed animals that to create beef, yeah, you need about six pounds or six kilograms to gain one pound. Yeah, in pork, it's about 3.45. In chicken, it's about two. Then in catfish, it's one on one. So if you feed the catfish one kilogram, he gains one kilogram. Very efficient. That's why people are getting you away from this because this is way too much climate change. Yeah, you need too much feed to just be able to let's see grow it. Nora is here. <laughs> right now. You need more proof how powerful milk can be? Okay, <laughs> but why can we drink milk from cows? That's another question. Yeah? The thing is that at a certain moment somewhere here in this area, yeah, about seven to 8,000 years ago, yeah, we, we were mutated. Yeah? There's a gene in an inside of all, most of you that was mutated and that made it possible to digest lactose. Because normally you cannot digest lactose. So the sugar inside of milk, normally you cannot digest. But suddenly this happened over here, yeah? and there is proof right now that the reason why we can drink milk is because of that gene effect. And that's because people then didn't have to hunt, but they were able to milk. They were having a source of protein, a source of fat. All over the world, we have di different uh, gene mutations. So this is the one in Western Europe. Then you have others in Africa. In China, for example, most people cannot drink milk, but they can digest cheese because cheese, for example, is very low, low in that sugar. Okay, I think I proved you enough that milk is not the best, the worst thing that you should, or let's say, avoid. We have a challenge. The challenge is that we need to feed people. 
A lot of people, yeah? And it's not coming from soy milk. Stop calling it soy milk. It's soy juice. It's not milk. Milk is the only thing that comes from an animal. Yeah? Soy milk, almond milk, it's not milk. It's juice on which they add vitamins and calcium so that you should would think that it's milk. Sorry for being a bit angry. Increased need for milk. <laughs> if we want to be able to feed the world, to give you an idea, the United Nations, the food organization of the United Nations, they estimate that we need about the double amount of milk just to be able to feed the people that are growing. We are the cause of the climate change. We're having more children. We're becoming developed. We're going to McDonald's and like cheese on our hamburger. We like to have milk. Ice cream in this corner, you saw it? There's ice cream there. We like it. It's a kind of development that we have. The problem is that we will need a lot of more animals to do that, and we don't have the space. Yeah? Because of the climate change as well, yeah, we need to have less animals. To give you an idea, if we are able to double milk production in the world yeah, by that time, then we could dramatically drop the number of animals we need to do that, which is better for welfare and so forth and so forth. So you probably start getting the picture. Efficiency through animal, let's say, to human brains. This is an animal from the, f uh, it's in fact the 70s, I put 50s. But what we incredibly did is we increased the efficiency by which she's converting food to milk. That's what we've been doing. This is a lady, you have to call her a lady. Yeah, she's alive. I visited her some weeks ago. Yeah, she's an, uh, an animal yeah, that you can visit also online. I hope my video is showing. Don't say the video is not showing. We tested it about 10 times just a second ago, but I'll show you the animal in a picture. This is an aftershock. It's a, a specific bull. Yeah, She's producing, to give you an ID, 3,500,000 kilograms in one year. She's the world record holder right now in when it comes to production. This animal alone can feed about 270 people in the world on one year. Problem is that the average cow in the world feeds only about 20 when you look at their intake in ice cream. Yeah, so it's brains because we made her more efficient. She's producing about uh, a tanker a year herself through g genetic, let's say, progress. Yeah, and to, let's say, technology on top of her. But of course, and this is the climate change issue, she also produces two trucks of manure. She needs about three trucks of water to do that. And then she produces, luckily, four gigabytes of data each animal. You start seeing why I did the intro, no? Data, data, data. Where is the data? I showed this one last year. I just gave it an update. Um, volume, velocity, all the Vs that we know. We've done a publication about welfare in animals and, and how you can use data to do that. To give you an idea, where is the volume coming from? There's a lot of data coming from the animals, labs, management software. There's precision livestock technology, which is being sent to the clouds. But the real challenge is not really that. It's especially the ownership. All these companies, they beat for the ownership. They think they're all the Googles of the world, and they beat for the ownership. Especially now that we are able to uh, get, let's say, a little bit of hair and, and a little bit of tissue. When, so when we give the animal a number, then we take a little bit of tissue from that animal, and then we check for her genes. Does she have the genes to produce milk? Does she have the genes to become healthy? That kind of things. And this is creating, let's say, gigabytes, even terabytes sometimes of data when we are looking at animals. We have been uh, looking at some publications. This is a, a GWA study that we've published very recently, creating, this is using a Spark flow, uh, so in a Spark um, data pipeline, which is eventually uh, published and peer reviewed about the genes in combination with specific, let's say, health traits in animals. We've published also, how do you look at data from animals? Do, how do you do that? Yeah, it's not easy. There's a new source of information, so people are collecting now milk samples, and then, then they do mid-infrared uh, technology on top of it, and then we try to learn from the mid-infrared spectra. This is again a Spark data pipeline which was published and which is product, uh, pr uh, producing a kind of a, a metric on top of the milk infrared to see if the animal is healthy in early lactation, yes or no. So we're doing a lot of things right now. We're putting a lot of sensors on these animals. This is an animal in Kentucky. She has almost every sensor that there is in the world. I'm creating this kind of uh, herd uh, very close by in the Netherlands right now. So I invite all the technology providers to come to my herd and then we can see, okay, what can the sensor mean? We're not comparing them. That's not my job, that's commercial. But what can we read from the sensors and what can we do with it? We have a lot of velocity as well because a lot of people send me updates of data. 
It gives me headaches all of the days. Also the variety. I have an, an immense amount of pipelines running just to try to keep the diversity, let's say, of databases, syntaxes correctly uh, uh, mapped towards each other. Data sources are different, dimensions, people budgets. This is a headache. Do you use Python? Do you use R? Whatever. Even people in Europe, we have a threat. That's the language that we speak. We don't understand each other once in a while. Yeah. This is my reality. My unique identifier is almost always broken <laughs> yeah, because the guy who had to give the tags was wrong. We, this is my, my reality where I live in. We also see often people uh, recording wrong data. So for example, there are animals that cough twice in a week in my data sets. That's impossible. She needs to carry an animal for about, let's say, nine months. So she cannot give birth two times in a row. Yeah, impossible. It happens in the data a lot. So I need to be able to deal with that uh, um, easily. We've even done now some um, uh, random forest analysis, which is uh, the kind of, uh, let's say, getting out the rubbish data to try to find out automated ways of, of, uh, of trimming, let's say, uh, the software data that's there. Okay, let's jump into the, um, the Sense of Sensor uh, project, um, because that one is, uh, is always um, more interesting, I think, for people with some data science um, um, in the back. So the Sense of Sensor project, um, to give you an idea, is a, um, is a, co is a combination of uh, the faculty of uh, Utrecht, where I work at the moment, with NEDAP. NEDAP is a uh, Nederlands Apparatenfabriek. It's an old company that was, in fact, creating a lot of sensor technology for other, let's say, industries. But they moved into the agricultural business. Then you have Wageningen University, which is a very known university when it comes to agriculture. And then VETFIS is a consulting group in the, in, the, in, the, um, um, in the project. Now, what do they have? I thought I was zooming into this, uh, this sensor first. So the animals have this tag around their neck. Don't be afraid, it doesn't hurt them at all. People sometimes ask me, can they lift their heads because the cow is eating? Yes, they can lift their head, it's nothing. The cow weighs about 700 kilograms and all of the equipment on top of her is about, let's say, 500 grams. So she doesn't feel anything when it's, uh, it's on her neck. Then on top, she has also this, uh, so this one she has on her neck, but she also has one uh, on her uh, feet. So it's a combination of a sensor, which is almost an accelerometer, and there's an accelerometer in her, um, in her, uh, in the collar over here. So what we did is we equipped, uh, or <laughs> I did not, but I was involved at a certain moment. Eight farms were equipped with the sensor on animals around the moment of calving, yeah, um, and then data was, let's say, produced. To give you an idea, what this normally is used for is, ex uh, is especially not this. So I'll show you um, what, what it mainly is used for at the moment is you can track lying and moving behavior of animals. So here you will see a line of the percentage of animals that are laying down, yeah, for example. So cows are standing up at a so certain moment, but on top, and you don't see it very well, but they also have um, um, uh, um, a tri, um, tripolation. Uh, damn, I forgot the name in English. So they can track the position of the animal. So what you see here is at a certain moment, all the animals are not laying down because they're being milked. This is the milking father. And then you see that all the uh, animals are grouped around there. And then they start spreading around in the farm again when they are done milking. So we're now looking, for example, in trying to re uh, use this data to learn from the animals what they are doing at which moment, uh, what, what kind of interactions. These are all ladies. And my excuse, 50 ladies in one room. What do you think? Yeah. A lot is happening. And we see that in cows as well. And we know, for example, that this, this kind of grouping effect, every time that we bring in a new cow, we know that the ladies start fighting for two days. And while they are doing that, they're not eating. They're not being healthy. Yeah? So that kind of information we learn from the sensor. It's also used to track fertility at this moment. But the use case that we had was especially not that. Yeah? So the use case that we had was, let's try to predict the moment of calving. Yeah? And I'll show you in a minute why that's important. Yeah. So from the 1st of July 2014 until 2016, these farms were equipped. That eventually led to about 2,000 animals, eight farms. Then they all had the tag, um, both of the tags, in fact. And then at least 28 b days before calving and then 28 days after calving, these animals uh, were uh, followed up. One of the PhD students that I'm working with at the faculty, he did an enormous amount of work. He chased these animals for two years, every farm. He visited every week. Then he was checking them on, on disease. He was checking them on specific data points that came out. 
Yeah. Eventually, from this, um, we had about uh, 600 million uh, data points um, that were, let's say, uh, all event-based. So an uh, event would be, for example, at this moment in time, and we had it even on a 15-minute um, basis, this is what the animal is doing. This is what the animal is doing. So um, to give you a little bit of background, the sensor itself is a bit of a black box. It's an, uh, we know that it's a neural network which is producing all these outputs. And that's already a weak point of the study, we know, but that's how reality is. These industries, they don't want you to <laughs> start digging into their accelerometers. Yeah, so you can get an output of what the animal is doing because they have trained the, the neural net. And for example, what you then get is um, you get, uh, let's say, the average bout length of an, uh, an eating of that animal is this. Bout length is every time that she eats, the, the they start recording, okay, she's eating now and now she stops. So for example, you get an output of 10 minutes she was eating today, yeah, on average, every time she ate. The number of times she ate, that's the number of bouts you see. Yeah, and then you see the 15 minutes. And then you go to the, for example, how long did she lay down? Because we know that an animal needs to lay down about 12 hours because when she's laying down, she's resting and she's producing milk. You don't want her to be up. Yeah, you don't want her to be up because then she's, let's say, not mo that she's moving around. And in fact, a cow that is really, really comfortable lays down. She stands to eat and she lays to, to rest yeah, and ruminate. So she ruminates and we can even rum track that. So ruminating is the moment that she chews her cut, we say. So the, her rumen content comes up again, yeah? she ruminates again, and then goes back. So in, in, uh, in a, a cow needs to re-eat, in fact. You don't like that word, I know, but that's how cows work. They need to burp up some food, they re-eat the, the food, and then it goes back. That's how they work. And the number of minutes she does that in a day is also very determining if she's sick or not. So to give you an idea, what we wanted to do is this kind of process. So this is a time lapse at a certain moment of an animal which is going to uh, give birth. So this animal is now moving around in this pen. Yeah, and at a certain moment, so you see she's, she's eating, she's still eating, then some guy is checking her. And then you see at a certain moment she's giving birth. Yeah? So now up and the calf is born. That's in fact what we try to predict, whether she will do that today, yes or no. Why is it important? Because there's an enormous economical pressure on farmers. The fact that you all think that water is cheaper than milk proves it. Milk is cheaper than water. So these guys that are doing it are on such an economical pressure yeah, that they have to produce this food which is extremely cheap yeah, with less and less labor. So there's a lot of automation. So what we want to do is try to avoid that we, do, we are not seeing the animal when it gives birth, because things can go wrong while giving birth. Most of you that have given birth, and I can assure you two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was so happy that there were people around us that were there to give birth to, to Nora. Yeah? At a certain moment when it goes wrong, you want to be there. You don't want what, you, what we say to have stillbirth, for example. Yeah? Stillbirth is when the animal dies while giving birth. Well, the small one, not the big one. You want to be able to see, for example, if we know that tomorrow she's given to give birth, we can already put her a bit in a separate box with extra straw. The video was not good, but that was the only one that at, at this moment I could find which was nice enough to explain. And then we also know that if we can give her the right environment, then she has less disease afterwards. If she's diseased, we need to use antibiotics. If she's on antibiotics, we cannot produce milk. So that kind of thing is the reason why we want to predict it. When I came into the project, there was one guy, the day that I entered the faculty, he said, come to me, I have data for you. And then he started showing Excel files, CSVs on a Dropbox somewhere. There was a SQL database somehow, and then they were doing fancy stuff they thought with RStudio and R. That's not possible with this kind of data. So immediately, um, we, um, I tried, to, that's, I have always been working for this uh, over the last 10 years. I use uh, what I say, my Bovi Analytics platform, that's to explain students. But in fact, it's just a kit of, let's say, all data science tools that you know. And I share every piece of code that I've been doing over the last uh, 10 years with everybody in the team. Why? Because they need to leverage on my, let's say, knowledge that I already have. And I cannot do that if it's in R with scripts somewhere in an email. 
So I organize all of this in a bit different way. So give you an idea, I store everything on blob. I like to move away from uh, uh, CSV files and put everything in parquet files because it's quite efficient to um, work with from my perspective, especially when you're training some models. I try to, uh, so I have my environment Jupyter Labs, but right now I'm playing around with the Databricks solution. Um, so Jupyter Labs is the place where I have all my notebooks which I sh share with students, PhD students, co-workers. And then in the back I use Kubernetes, which is orchestrating Spark, Scala um, a lot. I learn each student that comes into my room to work with Tableau. Wonderful. I have students that come in sometimes and they say, I did a t-test on, on the data. And then I say, okay, let's throw it away and let's start looking at the data. People overestimate the power of your own brains. Use your own brains and then start doing statistics. Yeah? And brains are visually, let's say, powerful. I uh, have the issue that right now I'm doing everything in Scala. Why? Um, I was introduced to the people from uh, Databricks and they told me at that moment Scala was a scalable Java way to go forward. I trained myself in Python as well. I must say that I still have a lot of students who are also thinking about moving away and uh, to Jupyter, especially if, want you, if you want to go to the deep learning part. There's a lot more open source tools in Python than Scala at this moment, but how, whatever. The nice thing about Apache Spark is that you can introduce them uh, with both uh, APIs. I played around with Elasticsearch and uh, Kibana a lot to visualize, but this one is uh, more powerful and then Azure has sponsored me a lot when it comes to computation. So what's my typical um, uh, work f uh, that I have to do? <laughs> Real calving dates. Stupid issue with calving dates with year 0017 instead of 2017. This kind of things, that's what you <laughs> encounter. Students are, for example, uh, creating an Excel file, but they forget to check the year that it's the correct year, and then you have these stupid data sets that come in because you need to have the right label. If you want to predict the moment of calving, you'd better have the right moment of calving. And then you have, for example, remove strange header characters. Students love to have give this very strange nomenclature, let's say, on, 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 on data sets, even farmers or the industry. I train people the first thing before they start collecting data. Let's use one naming convention. Naming convention, naming conventions. And they hate it because I think, what is this guy talking about? But naming conventions, agreeing about amongst each other, what is a cow, what is an animal, and how do we call it? Because that speeds up the way that you're, let's say, able to analyze your records. And then, of course, we have the feature preparations. So the first thing that we do, or I often do in this kind of project, is I uh, work with event-driven schemas. So what I do typically is I will have everything which I can map towards an event, I map it towards an event and then all the rest I store in the metadata, in a kind of a nested metadata. And then I have only one, let's say, very big data frame which I can manipulate in specific ways. Because, I, of course, we all know, especially when you're having this kind of data set, if you start joining, it gives a headache. Yeah? And that's when m most people, let's say, in research, uh, but also in the industry, struggle with. Yeah? So I try to work around and, uh, with that and the event-driven schema has helped me a lot. Then we have time series analysis. We create a lot of time uh, windows. So for example, give me a window of seven days of what the rest of the non-calved uh, animals were doing. So that's a window partitioned by herd identifier observation uh, type when she was three weeks before calving. This kind of things, this is what I typically do. But then for example, window seven day moving animal observation, I give a seven day, let's say rolling average and then look whether she's moving away from that uh, average, yes or no. This one is always very compute intensive. For this one, you always struggle. Um. But then you, for example, get this kind of uh, graphics. So this is the lag activity from these, uh, uh, all these animals. And what you see is that this is day 21 before calving. And then you see that it's moving up uh, at a certain moment uh, when she's calving. But the spread is enormous. Yeah. So the animals start, so when, sh when she feels that she's giving birth with, <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, with women, it's different. But uh, cows start standing up, down, up, down, up, down. They get very anxious because they don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, and that's when the leg activity uh, goes up. This is the number of stand-ups, the same. But you still see that even you have some animals that go down in, in, uh, in that. So you need a flexible model in the back then to start uh, um, looking at that. So the goal of the pipeline is two things. We want to learn, of course, can we predict the day of calving, but also, and this is quite interesting, the feature importance. I think a lot of, especially the deep learning at this moment, one of the nasty things about deep learning is feature importance. We all know it's not easy to get it out. 
Yeah, random forest for that, I love it. Yeah, you can quite quickly get feature importance out in most uh, libraries. I know there's a lot going on in the deep learning world to do that. Please do, uh, people who are into that, please make sure that the academic world also gets uh, output from that. So models needed to work on each farm. So we have a test training. So f we had data from eight farms and the approach at this moment, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I might be wrong uh, by trying to, to do it. But what we did so far is I said, let's use seven farms stratified by animals. So animals should not appear in the test and the training data set because you don't want to have that confounding. Um, use seven of the eight farms in the test training set. And then we had to leave one farm out, which means that I use the extra farm as a, as a validation. And then I repeated this eight times. So then we move up, we use all these farms and then uh, validate against the first farm. Why? Cross-validation, it needs to work. It needs to work on every form. That's the thing that we, we wanted to be sure of. To give you an idea, and this is, we're just, let's say, at this moment, it's a bit, um, we're starting to get the first results. Overall accuracy was 80%. And then if you look at the, the cross table, so this is the truth. The animal coughed or did not cough, then this is the prediction. And what you clearly see is that this is, but it's normal, is that in 95% of the cases, we were able to s correctly say, she will not cough tomorrow. So it's quite easy to tell from the sensors that she will not cough tomorrow. But the problem is, of course, what you see is this one, is that her sensitivity of the, the, the model at this moment is very low. Yeah. That's because we know that, and that's, this is where we are right now, exploring, okay, what's going wrong with the model is, and we know pieces of it, yeah, but the, there is this uh, high specificity, low sensitivity. Then if you look into the uh, different farms, and we're having some issues with two farms, so th these the numbers were left out. But you see, sensitivity can go up quite high, together with specificity. So this is interesting to learn what do these farms do different in the cross-validation, so we're now checking that out. This one is, uh, for me, as an academic, one of the most interesting things. If I look into the models, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, then number one, uh, feature importance laying day percentage change to the seven day animals, which means that um, the percentage change that the animal has in the uh, minutes per day she's laying down is uh, feature number one ranked in each of the herds. This is interesting because you need that feature. Yeah, that's uh, because now we start reducing, let's say, the models to a more simple model yeah, that don't need all the features and all the calculations. But then it's interesting to see that the number two switches between farms. So now I have the students working on this kind of uh, feature and test. Is there something going on with this feature? Is it difficult to, to, um, um, to uh, calculate? Maybe there's something wrong in the calculations. Maybe we need to have more attention for the data quality. Maybe we have missing values. That kind of approach is important when we look at it. So what's the future for us at this moment? Um, we have, of course, a very imbalanced data set. Um, we have a lot of did not cough. If you have only one day in the year when sh that she coughs, then you have a lot of did not cough. So that's why the specificity is very high and the sensitivity is rather low. So we're now looking at the balancing techniques. We're looking at uh, also some ensembles technique. Models need to be tuned furthermore. And of course, the deep learning, the neural net, you think, hey, why didn't you use that? Well, honestly, because I can't get, uh, I can't learn that much at this moment from the feature importance. I have one student also focusing on the neural nets at this moment just to see if it's possible, yes or no, to, to m make the predictions better uh, on the time series because the time series always give us headache. I have one last metric. If you go home yeah, and, and somebody asks you what was the session about, then just think about this one. This is a little boy. It's a story about 1% of the people who are feeding the 99%. That's what I want you to take mainly home from this session. Yeah and check your milk cost tonight. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you very much.